Welcome to the Applied Network Forensics course. Here we're looking at chapter four, tools used for analysis. My name is Arthur Solomon. I'm gonna be working with you throughout this course. So first of all, PCAP file locations. They are on GitHub. They are DEF CON puzzle pieces. What I mean by that is they are previous PCAP uh, puzzles created by, Def, by a group at DEF CON for use uh, at one of their competitions. We just kind of repurposed them to kind of help go through the basic uh, analysis functionality of network analysis. All the credit for the PCAPs go out to the DEF CON group. And again, I, I obtained them through DEF CON, so they get all the credit for creation of them. If you go to GitHub, you can type in my name. I have a user, find my user. I have two repositories. Currently, right now, we're dealing with the Applied Network Forensics. And so here are the test files, lab setup files, any of our um, lab setup uh, text documents and our evidence file. Evidence files are gonna be our PCAPs. If you're taking one of my courses, the PCAPs should be already in the course, but if you're not and you wanna follow along, that is where I got the PCAP files. All right, so one of the first tools we use in the course is hashing functions. So here's an example of some hashes, some common hashes. MD5, SHA1, SHA256, SHA512, and so forth. First of all, you need to understand what a hash is. A hash is a one-way calculation for file verification and validation. Meaning, if I want to download a file, I can look at the hash of the file and what I downloaded, and I can compare the two. If they are the same, I know they were not modified in transit. If they are not the same hash values, then some type of molestation has occurred and I wouldn't trust what I had downloaded. What should we be hashing? Realistically, when we're dealing with forensics, we want to hash just about anything. So output fields, you're gonna notice first of all that the traditional MD5 has an output bit in 128 bit length. That is how long it is. SHA-1's 160 bits. You'll notice it's longer. These two are the most commonly used. However, there have been uh, issues with them. They're dated. SHA-256 is kind of where it's going. This is newer standards. And you'll notice it's 250 bit in length. So it is way uh, larger to calculate. SHA-512, same thing, it's double, and so forth. So, when we are dealing with forensics, we want to double check with our organization to understand which algorithm to be using. To be safe, you may uh, include multiple algorithms instead of just a single one. However, you need to document which algorithm and which tool used. So that brings us to the question of hashing tools. In this course, we're gonna be looking at three main tools. HashCalc, CertUtility. CertUtility is a command line tool and get file hash, that is a PowerShell command. HashCalc is a installed program. Those are the three basic verification validation tools we will be using. So one of the last things about hashing I want to talk about is this rule of three. It is crucial that we validate our validation. We should always have three hashes. The goal would be to hash the original evidence, hash the clone evidence, and hash the evidence we're working off of. That way all three hashes should be the same. With that same principle, Within our course, what I like to do is I like to hash everything that we're working with one time with each tool. So if we're working with PCAP evidence one, I would hash it with hash calc, cert utility, and get file hash. 
That way I can confirm that all three tools are providing the exact same hash value. If I'm working with a Word document or photo pulled out of any of our evidence files, same thing, hash with all three tools. One of the uh, evidence that we're going to be working with actually does have a hashing issue where one tool calculates it one way and the other tools calculate it a different way. So I put that, I left that in there as a surprise to see who would find it. And again, if you're using the rule of three, you should be able to easily find it. So I've already done separate videos on getting the tools installed. I'll link those if you want them. But for right now, we're gonna start with HashCalc. Again, HashCalc, brief overview, types of algorithms. These three little dots are how you navigate the buttons. I want to go ahead and I want to hash this exe. I want to provide the md5, sha1, sha256. Calculate. And there they are. Pretty simple, pretty easy. So that's hash calc. Next, I want to do my command line. cmd. I want to go ahead and use cert utility. So it's cert util. I want to hash a file, so hash file, and I want to go ahead and give it the path of the file. Because it's on the desktop, I can drag and drop it, or if it's on a shared folder, drag and drop it, and it will give me the SHA-1 file. But what if I want the MD5 version of it? At the very end, I can type the algorithm, and it will give me the MD5. If I want to do the SHA-256, I can do that as well. Cert utility is just cert util, tac hash file, the location of the file, and the algorithm you want to use. So, what I want to do is bring up hash calc. So MD5 started with a 5.4 and ended with a 4.9. 5.4 ended with a 4.9. So I mean, it's pretty uh, accurate there. SHA-1 started with 16 and ended with AA. 16 ended with AA. You want to verify the entire string, but for this, for this video, for quickness sake, I'm just checking the first two and last two. And SHA-256 started with 28 and ended with 63. 28, 63. So we are good there. The next one will be based off of PowerShell. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move that to my center. Here we're going to do a git file hash. I make sure I spelled that correctly. I did. I'm going to drop in the location of the file and I want to go ahead and just do that. This will give me the SHA-256 variation of it. I want to go ahead and do the MD5 algorithm. So I will do algorithm MD5 MD5 and I want to do again the SHA-1 version of it. So what I did was I started typing algorithm, so TAC ALG, hit tab, so it filled out the rest of the command. That way you don't have to worry about spelling it out, spelling it out correctly and things like that. So again, I'm trying to focus that rule of three. Here we have the SHA-256, starts with 28, ends with 63, and it does. MD5 starts with 54, ends with 49, and it does. And SHA-1 starts with 16, ends with double A. All three programs concur. All three programs are sharing the same information. So uh, again, we talked about file molestation in transit. So I downloaded this EXE from Processor Hacker's website. 
But what's important to realize is this is the file I downloaded. This is the hash value, the SHA-256, that the website shows that was there. I can compare this, the file I downloaded, to confirm that the integrity is intact, to con ensure that both files are identical. And that is how I can use my validation and verification tool. All right, so again, rule of three is kind of what I'm looking for in our reports. Makes things go a little easier. Moving on, other tools are gonna be for collection and analysis. Two main categories, command line or GUI. Under the command line, we're gonna have dedicated chapters looking at T-Shark and TCP dump. And next week, we're gonna be looking at Wireshark and Network Miner a little bit more in depth. Most of what we're doing in this course is going to focus on Wireshark and Network Miner. This is the graphical user interfaces, so as you're starting out, these are a little bit easier based tools. However, we are going to get in the TCP dump, so we're going to have to be going through all of them. I've already done separate videos on Wireshark and Network Miner, but I will do a quick refresh just for completeness sake. Alright, so done with hash calc. You may get a pop-up for an update. I'm not updating it because I'm doing everything off the same tool sets. Again, we have our display filter. I'm gonna go ahead and open up one of the evidence files. We have our filter, we have our detailed pane, and then we have our actual details in hex. We're gonna do separate videos covering Wireshark in depth and how to filter, but I wanted to point out that this is one of the PCAP analysis tools, not the only one. Network Miner is also going to be another PCAP tool. I'm going to use it to open up Evidence 1. They analyze the PCAP slightly different ways. So that is what we need to, to realize. Go through the tabs. Make sure you know where we can pull data from. In Wireshark, we have our protocol hierarchy, we have our endpoints, we have our graphs, we have more detail. Endpoints are underneath the statistics. However, in Network Miner, they're underneath hosts, and you can drill down to what they are. Here we have a graphical user interface. This is probably a Linux machine. This is probably Linux. This is probably Windows. The other ones are unknown. You can drill down more detail to find MAC addresses, how many data uh, packets were sent and received, possible TTL, things of that nature, manufacturer of the NIC, and so forth. Do not just use a single tool. Here we have the ability to pull out files. You can do the same thing in Wireshark, but it requires more steps. One of the biggest hindrances that I see with learners when they first start out, they want to use a single tool for everything. Problem is, that quite doesn't work. We want to be able to use both tools and understand the strengths and weaknesses of each of those tools, which I've discussed in separate videos in the overviewing of these tools. I'll do later videos on how to use these tools filtering options, but for now, this was just a brief overview. There's miscellaneous tools like VirusTotal, like Netstat, like Process Hacker that we're gonna be digging into. Uh, Netstat was one that I did wanna show you. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you Netstat with attack A and O. So netstat will show all of my connections. You will see that me going to Google actually created additional connections. These 
one, two, three, four, five, six other connections are the Google page. So NetStat will show the states of our connections for TCP and UDP. I'm going to do attack A and O. These are going to list in more detail the local addresses, the foreign addresses, their states, and their PIDs, their processor IDs. I can open up Task Manager and I can look at the process ID. If I want to see what is using PID number P or PID number 908, SVC host is using PID 908. If I want to see which is using 6060, 6060 is using the search UI, which that's part of the search and Cortana application. It's currently suspended, but there are still established connections. I want to be looking at what is using 7088. Chrome happens to be using 7088. So I can start figuring out what the processes that are using these connections by looking at their process ID. Process Hacker is just a much more in-depth version of Task Manager. So there are some advanced tools. SANS has a ton of them. But again, this course is an introductory course for network forensics. So we may reference some of these tools. We're not going to be using them. SANS, uh, both of the SANS Swift and Moloch tool are used for capturing large PCAP files. 50, 60, 70 gig files. Not our 1 meg, 2 meg based files that we're going to be working with with this course. The larger the files, the little more complex that they get. So again, that's outside the scope of this course. We also have uh, things like NFDump, which will be used for NetStat, which we'll be discussing that later in uh, later lectures. All right, so that's all for I had for this course, for this chapter. If there are any questions or concerns, please reach out. Let me know. You have a good day.